the Word of Faith Netcast is on the air. Well, praise God, it's time for another Word of Faith Netcast. I'm glad you could join us. For this netcast, I tell you what, this is netcast number 194, and uh, I am just excited to be able to come to you. Sorry it's been so long. We've had another little hiatus here uh, on the netcast, but we're back, and I'm doing it actually late in the afternoon, so hey, as the light shifts, you'll at least know what's going on. (laughs) Uh, So while we got some daylight, let's get into the Word of God, amen? We're going to go to, uh, let's see, where shall we start? Uh, if you got your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 12. Let's get that ready. And then let's also go to the book of John. That's the Gospel of John. Not uh, as they call it, Little John. You know, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, they call it Little John sometimes. But we're talking about the Gospel of John. And verse, or chapter, I should say, chapter 14. And we're going to get into some things here that I believe are going to be a blessing to you. Let's look at John 14:1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, you know it's interesting to me. <laughs> Let's do a little side journey here. It's interesting to me that Jesus didn't say, uh, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to build you a shack out back because I want you to be humble and poor. <laughs> Did you notice he didn't say that? He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Isn't it interesting that even people who preach against prosperity believe that when they get to heaven, they're going to have mansions? You know, you'd have thought that if God was anti-rich, he'd be anti-rich in heaven as well as earth. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) No, 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 of course not. The reason Jesus is going to prepare mansions is because his image of you is blessed. He sees you as rich. Amen. He became poor that we might be made rich. And that does not mean rich spiritually. You know, when you're born again, it's not a matter of whether you're poor or whether you're rich. You are born again. You're about as rich spiritually as you can get because you're born again. Amen. No. No. The word rich that's used there, when it says he became poor that you might be made rich, is the Greek word plautos. It means wealthy with financial possessions. I mean, <laughs> how can you get around that? You know, I mean, if, if God's going to give me a mansion in heaven, I don't think he minds me having one down here. Now, you know, I got a really, let me just tell you, between you and me, I got a really nice house. I love the house we're in. We are blessed. Hallelujah. But it's not a mansion. Not even by stretch. But I tell you what, it's nice. And it's nice for me and my family. It suits us real well. To be honest, if I had a four-story mansion, I don't know what I'd do with it. Okay, that's just me. You know, my dad... Boy, I'm really digressing here. My dad loved log cabins. He would rather have had a log cabin than anything else just because he loved log cabins. Well, that's his choice. And if in heaven he wants to have a log cabin, I mean, he's there now, so who knows. (laughs) But if he wants to have a log cabin, he can have one. But I guarantee you the logs will probably be solid gold. (laughs) Praise the Lord. So if you're looking forward to being poor in heaven, you might as well get over it because Jesus is preparing a mansion. Now, if you want to go live out back in the shack, I guess you can if you want to, but he's preparing a mansion. All right, I just wanted to kind of kind of get past that whole thought process. In my father's house are many mansions. You know, uh, I'm going to digress just a little further here, as long as we're on this topic. Uh, notice it says there's many mansions. I mean, if, if you had a big old mansion, it looks like you'd put a whole lot of people in that big old mansion. But no, he said there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, place here is the Greek word topos. The transliteration is T-O-P-O-S, topos. It means a spot, 
generally in space, but limited by occupancy, whereas it is larger, but in a particular locality. That is a location as in a position, a home, or a tract, figuratively a condition, an opportunity, specific, specifically a scabbard, meaning a place where you put your sword, a, a home for your sword. So <laughs> it's just interesting to me that the spot he's preparing is limited by occupancy. Okay, so there's many mansions and he's going to have one for you. Now, praise the Lord, I hope you enjoy mansions, because you're going to have one, <laughs> praise the Lord. All right, well, I just there's a couple little side topics there that it was worth taking. Let's keep going in verse two, uh, verse uh, 3, I should say. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Now Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now get this, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now see, right today, there is a teaching, and that teaching is called universalism. And universalism says, uh, you know, everybody's going to be saved. It doesn't really matter what you believe. And there are different levels of that. And one of the things that is taught under a universalistic teaching is you can be a Buddhist, you can be a Muslim, you can be a Confucianan or whatever. I don't know if that's a word or not. But you can believe all these different things, and you're going to end up going to heaven because God is just so loving and kind and sweet. It doesn't matter what you believe. You know, Jesus didn't believe that. Jesus didn't teach that. He was actually, if you want to get right down to it, just between you and me, he was kind of narrow-minded by today's reckoning. I know some of you said, oh, Dr. Bill, how can you say that? I'm not saying I believe that. I'm saying that's if you listen to people that teach this kind of universalism, you'd think that's what they think because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody gets to the Father except by me. Well, it seems to me by today's standards, you'd think that was narrow-minded, wouldn't you? Well, you know, it's like I told somebody many, many years ago. I can afford to be closed-minded because I know the truth. <laughs> Once you know the truth, then there's no need to be open I just hit my microphone stand there. There's no need to be open to other points of view because you know the facts. You know the truth. Well, that's what Jesus is telling us here. He said, verily, truthfully, I'm telling you the truth. I am the way. If he knew he was the only way, and if again, between you and me, I think he knows one way or the other. If there was a back door you could sneak into heaven, I suspect he knows where it is, but and I'm being facetious here to make a point, you understand that. I'm saying that because a lot of this junk you hear taught, if you really examine it in the light of day, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Jesus is the only way. Universalism cannot be accurate, it cannot be true, it cannot be valid, because Jesus said, I'm the only way. He told the disciples, you know the way. They said, we don't know the way. He said, look, guys, I'm the way, okay? And there's no other way. You know, it's not a matter of I'm just trying to be narrow-minded here. There is no other way. Matter of fact, when you get right down to it, he was trying to get them some information that would be beneficial to them individually, spiritually. He didn't want them to think there was other ways that maybe they could pursue. He wanted it made clear. These guys were friends of his. I mean, after all, he, he told them, he said, I have called you friends. Amen? Now, he wanted them to know there's only one way and I'm it. Don't be distracted. Don't be pulled off in other directions because there's only one way, and that's Jesus. All right. Let's keep going here. Verse 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the... No man. No man. You know, a lot of people might say, well, I'm one of those exceptions. No, he said no man. No man is no man. 
can come unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Well, now Philip was a little confused by that. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, <laughs> and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou knowest not uh, uh, that thou not know me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And now listen to that. He that has seen me, he's telling Philip, You're looking at me right now with your eyes, okay? Anybody who's seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not? that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. What he's saying is, and this is what I want you to keep in mind as we continue with this study here, what he's saying is, what I'm telling you are God's words, not my words. These are God's thoughts, not my thoughts. He did only what he saw the Father do. He said only what he heard the Father say. He was completely submitted to the Father's will. Now that's going to become important here in our study in just a few minutes, and I want to make that totally clear to you. Now you say, well, Dr. Bell, I know that. That's not news. Okay, then, hold that in your mind, because we're going to pursue something here that is going to be really important from that point of view. Okay, let's keep going. Um, verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, they're not my words, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily. Now there he goes again. Verily, verily. Now, I know verily is not a word we use normally in <laughs> modern English. That's a good old King James word, verily. What does it mean? It means truly, firmly, absolutely. There is no more definitive way of saying this is the way it is than verily. Okay? Now, it's one thing if he said verily. He said it twice. Verily, verily. <laughs> truthfully, truthfully, really, I'm serious. So what he's about to say must be pretty important. Wouldn't you agree? Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, if you just stopped right there, whoo, we could have us a shouting fit, couldn't we? I, hallelujah, praise God, anything I ask, he's going to do it. Hallelujah. But the next verse is just as important. Are you ready for it? Remember, Jesus said, this is the Father speaking, it's not me speaking. Okay, what's the next verse? If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, man, Jesus, come on. You just told me anything I prayed in your name, you'd do it. Now here you go talking about keeping commandments. That's legalism, Jesus. Don't talk to me about legalism. Now, a lot of people I know are saying, Oh, Dr. Bill, I would never say that to Jesus. If he were standing there in front of me saying that the words that I'm saying are the Father's words, not my own, I would never say. Well, let me ask you this. If you're a believer and you're standing there saying that what the Bible says is not valid for us today because we live under grace and we don't have to do squat anymore, you know, I'm I'm living in grace. You don't that's bondage, bondage. I, I don't want to be bound by law. I don't want to have to fulfill commandments. Well, let me say first of all that I am absolutely one hundred percent in agreement with the fact that your obeying commandments does not get you saved. Okay? 
it is not of works, lest any man should boast. I am fully aware of what Ephesians says, okay? But we're not talking about after, we're not talking about getting born again. We're talking about after you get born again. After you get born again and you're praying to Jesus and you're in a position where you're asking anything in his name, see, that's believers that do that. Then he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, that puts it in a little different light, doesn't it? If you love me, now see, Christians today, I guarantee you, I love the Lord, Dr. Bill. Oh, I love the Lord. Well, if you love the Lord, keep his commandments. Yeah, but I, I don't have to keep commandments anymore because I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Don't use your freedom as an occasion to the flesh. That's in the Bible too, isn't it? Isn't it? So, what do I mean by that? Don't use your freedom as an occasion to the flesh. This whole greasy grace teaching that's going around these days, where everybody's talking, oh, we're not into faith anymore, into grace, 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 grace. I'm part of the grace movement. I'm part of the grace movement. I, I hear a TV preacher in his commercial talking about, we're part of the grace movement. Well, I'm all for grace, praise God. Amen. Grace is awesome, and it's important, and it's valid. But it is not an excuse to live according to the flesh. That is not what grace is for. Grace provided salvation. God had grace toward mankind because he sent his son Jesus Christ to redeem us from sin, the whole sin problem. And yes, Jesus' obedience to die for our sins solve the sin issue. But once you receive that, once you're born again, once you have done what you should do to receive Jesus Christ as Lord, believe that God raised him from the dead and believe and confess him as Lord in your personal life. Lord means he's in control. He can ask you to do what he wants you to do and you'll do it. That's what a Lord is. Don't forget what Lordship is about. But if you do those things, you're born again. But once you're born again, he says, if you love me, you're born again now. You're a child of God. God's your father. I'm your brother, your elder brother. But if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, we're not talking about you know, you got to keep these commandments or you won't be born again anymore. No, no, no. We're not talking about that. We're talking about keeping commandments that are God's desire for your life because you love the Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments. Don't say, well, you know, I don't have to tithe anymore. I don't have to go to church anymore. I don't have to do anything anymore because I'm free. I'm free by grace. Hallelujah. But I love the Lord. If you love God... If you love Jesus, keep his commandments. I see it's important to understand what commandments are. Commandments, it says, and I'm going to just hover over it right here with my eSword, which is, by the way, e-sword.net. You can download it for free. And the Greek word here is entole. Entole, that's the transliteration. And it means injunction, that is an authoritative prescription an authoritative prescription. And I've used this example before, but it bears repeating just to remind you. If you go to a doctor and you present some symptom to that doctor and he evaluates that symptom and he says you've got this and this, that and the other, whatever it may be, and oh by the way, here is a prescription for you. You go fill this prescription and take this drug and it will alleviate the symptom and you will be healed from that sickness or disease. Do you go, oh no, I'm not going to take that prescription and fill it because that's bondage. No. You say, give me the prescription, I'm going to the drugstore, I'll pay for it and I will take that drug and I will get the benefits of it. Hallelujah, he found the problem. You don't take the authoritative description prescription as a problem, you take it as a solution. Do you understand the difference? If my, pers if my 
perception, that's the word I'm looking for, if my perception of a prescription is that it is a benefit to me, I will take it gladly. If my perception of that prescription is that it's a problem to me, I will not do it. I won't take it. Okay? And to be honest, there in the natural, there are some medicines that have harsh enough side effects that it's, the side effects are worse than the disease you're trying to cure. But we won't go there. My point is the authoritative prescription is for your benefit. And in this case, if it's God, I guarantee you, God's authoritative prescription is for your benefit. So here's what Jesus is saying, verse 15. If you love me, keep my authoritative prescriptions, my commandments, because they are for your good. Do you understand that? Then he goes on to say, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. Now see, if he was giving you an authoritative prescription or a commandment to do because he just wanted to punish you, why in the next breath would he turn around and say, I'm going to send you another comforter? I mean, if, if he was saying you need to keep the commandments just because he wanted to rain on your parade and make it hard on you, why would he send you a comforter? Why not a, a persecutor? <laughs> Well, that's the devil. We don't need one any more of those, okay? <laughs> no, he says, I'm going to give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. And that's what we need these days is truth, not a whole bunch of junk and garbage and greasy grace false doctrine. Don't get me started. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Verse 21. He that hath my commandments, my authoritative prescriptions, and keepeth them, that means you've got to keep the commandment that he gives you, which, by the way, those authoritative prescriptions are things like confess the word of God, speak the word, pray, tithe, go to church, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Those are commandments. Those are words of Jesus that we're to live by. He says, he that hath my authoritative description, prescriptions or commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. Now, every Christian I know that I talk to would agree they want to have manifestation. They want to pray and they want to get manifestation. They want manifestation of the supernatural in their life. They want God to manifest himself to them and make himself real and clear to them. They want that manifestation. Well, then guess what? You need to love God. And how do you love God? You keep his word. Now, see, a lot of people are saying, well, we don't have to do that anymore. We have greater revelation. The revelation of Paul is much greater. You know what? seems to me that the words of Jesus that he said in the Gospel of John are pretty authoritative. Nothing against Paul, but frankly, what Paul is saying does not contradict what Jesus is saying. And oh, by the way, I want to remind you of what we said earlier. Jesus said, these are not my words, these are the Father's words. Well, whose word are you going to take? Jesus and the Father? Or some guy who's teaching just a portion of Paul's teaching out of context? Truth be told, what Paul is teaching in his writings agrees 100% with what Jesus is saying here that are the Father's words to the body of Christ. They are not in contradiction. I do not mean to imply that Paul is not teaching the truth and that Paul's revelation is not valid. It is 100% valid. But the problem with false doctrine, like Greasy Grace false doctrine, is they take an element of truth and then they just twist it just enough that it becomes false. See, I know that the primary preacher of Greasy Grace Doctrine, I'm not going to name his name, but the primary preacher of Greasy Grace Doctrine says, 
Jesus did it all. That's true. Your uh, obedience to God and his word is not the primary concern. It is that Jesus was obedient to God and his word, and Jesus' obedience is all that counts, not yours. There's a grain of truth in that. Jesus' obedience to go to the cross. Jesus' obedience to do the will of the Father. Jesus' obedience to speak God's word only and not sin was vital and valid and is absolutely the core of our belief and of the system of faith. But that does not negate your requirement to obey the word after you're born again. It does not ne negate your faith in the word of God once you're born again. And throwing aside the message of faith and throwing aside everything that we've learned from the word of God, because now we live under grace, is false doctrine personified. That is my point. We need to obey the Word of God to have the results of the Word of God. To have God manifest Himself to us. Hallelujah. Well, we're running out of time. And i got a few things I want to talk to you about here before we close. Not the least of which is that you need to tune in to Word of Faith Radio, W-O-F-R dot O-R-G. I'm putting it right on the screen right here. You need to go there and you need to hear the Word of God preached in an uncompromising fashion with all this greasy grace mess and hear what you need to do to partake of the benefits of the Word of God. So do that. The other thing I want you to do is write me here at Word of Faith Ministries. Our address is Word of Faith Ministries, P.O. Box 5213-5213, High Point, North Carolina. The zip code is 27262. You can also, of course, write me at my email address. I encourage you to do that. My email address is Dr. Bill, D-R-B-I-L-L, -L, at W-O-F-M dot O-R-G. Join us next time. Get into the Word of God at Word of Faith Radio. And, oh, by the way, go to our website as well, W-O-F-M dot O-R-G, Word of Faith Ministries. Go to that website. Take advantage of all the teaching there, the uh, the audio teaching, the video teaching, all the things that we have available for you, because I believe it will be a blessing to you. And remember, until next time, to fulfill the Word of God. The Word of Faith Netcast is brought to you by Word of Faith Ministries and our partners around the world.